New Testament reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verses 5 to 19. You'll find it in the Good News Bible, in the New Testament section of page 108. Some of the disciples were talking about the temple, how beautiful it looked, with its fine stone and the gifts offered to God. Jesus said, All this you see. The time will come when not a single stone here will be left in its place. Every one will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will this be? And what will happen in order to show that the time has come for it to take place? Jesus said, Watch out, don't be fooled. Many men claiming to speak for me will come and say, I am he. And the time has come. But don't follow them. Don't be afraid. When you hear of wars, revolutions, such things must happen first, but they do not mean that the end is near. He went on to say, countries will fight each other, kingdoms will attack one another. There will be terrible earthquakes, famines, and plagues everywhere. There will be strange and terrifying things coming from the sky. Before all these things take place, however, you will be arrested, persecuted, you'll be handed over to be tried in synagogues and to be put in prison. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my sake. This will be your chance to tell the good news. Make up your minds ahead of time not to worry about how you will defend yourselves, because I will give you such words and wisdom that none of your enemies will be able to refute or contradict what you say. You will be handed over by your parents, your brothers, your relatives, and your friends, and some of you will be put to death. Everyone will hate you of me, but not a single hair from your heads will be lost. Stand firm, and you will save yourselves. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you our God and our Redeemer. Amen. Two readings this morning, and they're almost contradictory. And unusually, the Old Testament reading was full of hope, full of promise of great things, a new celestial city, <coughs> And the New Testament reading is one somewhat of gloom. How there's going to be suffering, but we will come through it. That passage from St. Luke's Gospel <clears throat> was written, in fact, after some of those prophecies had come true. <laughs> Jerusalem was absolutely raised to the ground. At least the temple was. Not one stone was left standing on another. The Romans decided to put down the rebellions that were going on against the Roman Empire. And they literally destroyed the magnificent 
the temple that Herod had uh, renovated. But, uh, and so, what Luke was saying was, you see, Jesus' words have already come true. But it also meant that the other things that Jesus was saying about everything working together for good would also be true. And so that in spite of suffering, in spite of disaster, all would be well and all things would be well. Many, many people have risen out of suffering, out of affliction, out of devastatingly sad times <clears throat> to go on to do great things. Those of you, well, in fact, all of you, almost all of you, I'm sure, have listened to the music of Tommy Dorsey. His story is quite an incredible one. It was during the 1930s that Thomas Dorsey created, virtually started what we now know as gospel music. The African American religious music which married secular blues with sacred text. For many years he, as a young man, played the blues with uh, the blues artist Ma Rainey and her wildcat Jasper. And he wrote over 400 compositions. And we're going to think about one of them particularly later. He was the son of a Baptist preacher in Georgia, Atlanta, Georgia, in the southern states. His mother was a church organist. And throughout his childhood and youth, he was always torn between the secular and the religious. <clears throat> he left school when he was 11. He was a dropout because he wanted to get a job in the local vaudeville theater. And six years later, he left Atlanta and went to live in Chicago. And he found success almost immediately. He was known as the whispering piano player because he had to play quietly so police wouldn't hear because it was the time of prohibition and he was playing in a speakeasy. He had a break when he was 21 and he went back home to Atlanta to convalesce and there his mother really tore into him. She told him off and said stop playing these blues Served the Lord, <coughs> but he ignored her and returned to Chicago, playing again with Marie. He married his sweetheart, but in 1925, a second breakdown made him unable to play music at all. It took him three years to get over that. And he committed himself to completing uh, to composing. Music. <clears throat> but <clears throat> all the mainstream churches refused to play his music. He said once, well, I've been thrown out of some of the best churches in America. But then there was the crisis. His wife died and his son died as she was giving him birth. And it was at that point that he sat down and had the courage to write one of his most 
famous numbers. Precious Lord, take my hand. The music was something that he had heard some years before. But he wasn't quite sure about it. And he adapted it and changed it. And then he wrote the words to go with it. He said, I can't take credit for this stuff. I'm only human, and these things are the makings of God. Lots of people have, in fact, written sacred music and not claimed that it was really them writing it. Martin Gay, like Paul Simon, when he wrote what has become a great song, Bridge Over Troubled Water. He says, Paul Simon says, the words and the melody, all of that came snapping his fingers, just like that. And so, without any more ado, I think there is nothing more fitting than to sing together the hymn, Precious Lord. Take my hand. Hymn number 670. <laughs> Treasures Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Let me stand. <laughs> 